Well, let's get started uh, with the uh, announcements. I'll leave that poll up for a couple more minutes. Um, so I've got the course roadmap up, and so you can take a look at that. We'll talk about that in, in a minute. You should be seeing that on the screen. Um, so, uh, so, so Simulation Lab 4 uh, should be posted at this point. The videos are not. I was having a problem with YouTube processing videos. That's why the lecture video uh, was up there late. And so I got that fixed. Now I'm going to get the uh, lab videos posted. So that will happen shortly. Um, if, if you do not see the lab assignment itself, please let me know, but that should be up there, the assignment and the pre-lab. In fact, let me check real time. Someone said they don't see it under the assignments. I'm going to click on it right now and check. And it is, well, Although part of it is showing published, part of it is showing not published. So let me fix that right now. So your simulation lab four should be up there at this point. The videos will take uh, a little while for me to upload now that I've got my YouTube thing straightened out. So you'll see that. So at this point, you should see the, or in a few minutes, you should see simulation lab four uh, uh, posted. That has to do with semiconductors. So uh, the upcoming homework assignments, so homework seven is due this week. And next week, we will have the final exam. So Wednesday will be dedicated to the uh, fi final exam. And uh, we'll do a actually a review on Monday. So we'll go over problems related to the final exam. I'll post the review problems that are uh, uh, old final exam problems. And the practice problems are, are already up there related to the final exam. So we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to the review. And Monday, so depending upon the timing of today's class, uh, Monday will be, we'll start out with motors, motors, stepper motors, servos, and then we'll move on to the review. So look for that on Monday. I want to get you well prepared for the exam. So as always, my office hours will be right after class. Come join if you want to chat or hear other people's questions. And uh, it's it's been it's been great working with you guys. Uh, there have been no audio problems. People have been participating. That's awesome. And so keep doing that. Uh, unmute when you want to talk. Uh, otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise down. And again, you guys are awesome at that. And if I drop off during the class for technical issues, I will be back as soon as I can. Hasn't happened yet, knock on wood. So on the on the course uh, roadmap here, we finished up operational amplifiers, uh, which ended in sort of a digital flavor in that we had a an operational amplifier making a decision on whether a voltage was higher or lower than another voltage. And it output either a high or a low, right? Five volts or zero volts. And, and that that's where the digital flavor is because digital logic and digital systems that use binary numbering and binary logic use high and low values, one, zero, true, false, yes, no. And, and so uh, a uh, comparator is actually one interface that you can use between analog systems, continuous voltages, and digital systems to provide an input from a sensor, whether it exceeds a certain value or not. So that's a good segue into digital logic systems. And, and last time we, we talked about bits, words, bytes, and then uh, we talked about binary numbers and hexadecimal numbers. So that's how computers represent numbers. And, and what we're going to do now is we're going to start talking about, and we're going to finish talking about, how circuits and computers, but circuits in general, can make decisions based on sensor inputs, digital inputs, and uh, and, and introduce uh, Boolean logic and logic gates, okay? So what I'm gonna do now, um, I'm going to switch over to the the whiteboard, and kind of in introduce combinator combinatorial logic. So let me do that. So, 
So at this point, you, you should not see me, but you should see my my whiteboard. And let me let me talk a little bit about combinatorial logic. Um, combinatorial logic does this for you. It it makes decisions based on present inputs. So if you have uh, a, a, a sensor or, or a switch that provides uh, a value, like it's either closed or open, or maybe a sensor is higher or lower than a certain value, right? Like a, like a thermostat. Um, th those would be inputs to combinatorial logic. That's inputs to this logic. The output is a true or false, yes or no, do something or don't do something. Okay, so combinatorial logic is based on uh, based on current inputs, or I should say present, so I don't confuse it with current as in voltage and current. So based on present inputs, and that means there's there's no typically no memory. I mean, consider it to have no memory. It only cares about what's happening right now, and uh, it makes a decision. And typically it has one output. I mean, you could argue it could have multiple outputs, but I would consider those to be separate combinatorial uh, logic circuits. Um, and, and so let me, let me talk about an example. Uh, you might have to make a decision. You know, what do I mean by decision? You might want your circuit to make a decision such as this. Uh, let's let's take a, a, a car for example. There there might be logic that maybe you're designing that decides whether or not the starter motor should turn right to start the car. And one obvious input is uh, is the key turned right? Is the key turned to the start position or is the start button pu pushed? That's well you know you could have that directly control the starter, but there might be other inputs. Uh, that you would want to make the decision as to whether the starter motor should turn and start the engine. Uh, for example, is is the is the car in park or you know neutral, uh, d depending upon the transmission. Um, let's see, is is the uh, I don't know maybe is the driver's seat belt on? Is uh, uh, is the airbag deployed? Right, if the airbag is deployed, maybe you want some kind of fault resistance there where where you don't have a uh, an event that could start the car if the bag is airbag is displayed. So th there's all these there's all these different inputs you could think of, uh, at, at least two, maybe five or six inputs where you could think of all the possible combinations of those inputs and have one output: the starter motor turns or the starter motor doesn't. That's what combinatorial logic does. It takes the present inputs and makes it a decision. Um, we we base these on uh, gates, logic gates. So we're gonna talk about some logic gates. They're a fundamental building block of logic circuits that let you make decisions like, like I just talked about. Okay, so, so what I wanna do now is introduce, introduce a few logic gates. Okay, so, so we'll start out uh, with, with a common gate. It's called the AND gate. Okay, so this is this will be an AND gate. Um, the gate has a schematic symbol that looks like this. Let me make that a little clearer. This is it has a kind of a round front and a flat back. Looks like this. Okay, so that schematic symbol is an AND gate, and uh, so flat here, round in the front. It has inputs on the left and an output on the right. And it perform performs an AND function. Here, let's define what that means. Uh, I'm going to write variables, capital letters here, that represents the two inputs, A and B, and the output, C. Now, those are Boolean variables, or I should say uh, logical values or logical variables. They represent 
uh, a true or a false or a one or a zero or a yes or a no, however you want to think about it. And they are associated with a voltage. We talked last time about five volt logic nominally in five volt logic. A one is represented by about five volts and a zero is represented by zero volts. And there's a range there, but nominally zero volts and five volts. So there are voltages represented here, but, but we're not going to pay attention much to what the actual voltage is. We're going to pay attention to what the voltage represents, a one or a zero or yes, no, true, false. Okay. So this AND gate takes in two logical inputs, outputs, a logical output, those are binary values. And the AND gate answers this question, are both of my inputs true? Okay, so that's why it's called an AND gate. Um, and you can describe that statement, are both of my inputs true, with this AND gate. Look, there are a couple other ways you can describe that. Uh, the other is called a truth table. So a truth table um, actually has a list. And let's draw one out here. Let's draw the truth table for an AND gate. It has a, a t uh, the columns are the inputs and the output. So on the left of the line, those are the inputs. On the right is the output. And what you do when you, when you create a truth table, you're describing what this gate does, what this function does. And on the left, you list all possible combinations of inputs, okay? And one way to list all possible combinations of inputs is just to start with zeros, all right? That's a zero in binary, and then count up in binary. So zero, one, one, zero, one, one. So if you remember binary counting, converting to decimal from last time, this is zero, one, two, three. Those are all possible combinations of, of inputs uh, that, that you could have for this gate. On the right, you list the output corresponding to those inputs. So remember the AND gate answers, are both of my inputs true? No, right? Go to the next row. Are both of my inputs true? No, right? Are both of my inputs true? No. Are both of my inputs true? Yes. So that's the truth table for an AND gate. And so that's what this does. If you have, I'll go back to voltage for a second. If this is five volt logic and you have five volts on A and five volts on B, then C would be five volts. If you have zero volts on A, five volts on B, C would be zero volts. Okay, but we're not gonna talk about voltage much. We're just gonna talk about the values, the logical values that they represent. Okay, there's another way to describe this AND gate and uh, that is as a logical multiplication. So C equals A times B. So this looks like a, an algebra equation, right? C equals A times B. Um, the difference is that it's, it's not regular algebra, it's, it's a Boolean expression, which means when you have a multiplication shown in an equation, it means this truth table. It means that gate. It's a way to describe that. Okay, so, so A times B is only one when A and B are one. And if either A and B are zero, C is zero. So that's what this means. It's a, it's a different way of, of, uh, of, of writing this. So this is actually, the AND gate is actually a logical multiply. Okay, or a logical multiplication. So that's what an AND gate does. What we're going to do is we're going to go through these gates, and so you, you know you'll you'll memorize what each of these gates does. You'll know what they do by their description, and then we're going to put these gates together to make something useful happen. Okay, but we got to start here. So that's an AND gate. Um, let's move on to the OR gate. Okay, so the OR gate. Uh, looks like this. So the OR gate its schematic symbol was kind of a curved input side 
and the output side comes to a point. Okay, so that's an OR gate. And I have two inputs here, A and B. The output is C. And the truth table looks like this. A, B, C. And again, I list all possible combinations of inputs. And then the corresponding output. The OR gate answers the question, uh, are either or both of my inputs true? Okay, so, and if that statement isn't you know, perfectly clear, if it's a little ambiguous, here's really what it means, that uh, the truth table looks like this. So if either or both inputs are true, then the output is true, or a one. Okay, so that's, that's what an OR gate does. It is actually a logical addition. So C equals A plus B. So it's a logical add. Okay, so that's what an OR gate does. Um, there's a, th so these, these are really common gates. Uh, there's another gate called a uh, logical inverter. Okay, so a logical inverter, uh, it does what you would expect, it inverts. It looks like this, it's, a, it's kind of a smaller version of an op-amp triangle with a bubble on the output, right, on the outside. It has one input A, one output B, and its truth table is really easy. Uh, has, it has one input, one output. Here are all possible combinations of inputs, zero and one. And the output is the logical inverse. So if you put in a zero, you get out a one. If you put in a one, you get out of a zero. You get out a zero. And that means that uh, it, it takes five volts on the input. If it's five volt logic, you get zero volts on the output and vice versa. Um, and I'll stop talking about voltage, but I just wanna point out that, that that's, that's what would happen if you actually had five volt logic and connected this chip and applied inputs and measured the output. The, the expression uh, looks like this. So when you put a bar over a logical variable, it, it means invert. Okay, so this truth table, this expression, that symbol all mean the same thing. Okay. Um, there is a another gate uh, that I want to bring up. It's called an exclusive OR. Okay, so an exclusive OR, uh, it looks like, an, sort of like an OR gate, well, it looks a lot like an OR gate. Right, there's my OR gate, but it has kind of a, an extra curve at the input side. Okay, so it has this extra kind of separated curve back there. And the uh, exclusive OR gate asks the question, uh, are either of my inputs true but not both, okay? So its truth table uh, looks like this. So I have A, B, C. Oops, put that in the wrong place. Okay, so you get uh, zero, zero. Oh, I'm gonna list all co possible combinations of inputs, right? And then list the corresponding output for each row. And so you get, uh, like, is either input true but not both? No. Either input true but not both? Yes. Either input true but not both? Yes. Either input true but not both? No. Okay, so that's the truth table for a, uh, an exclusive OR gate. It's also called an XOR. So if you see XOR, that's exclusive OR. The, the way you would write this in a logical expression or a Boolean expression is this. C equals A plus, with a circle around it, B. 
and there's a special name for that ad uh, for that edition and we're going to call it a modulo 2 modulo sorry trying to squeeze this in here modulo 2 ad and I'll show you why uh, when we start connecting uh, these symbols to actually how you would implement this in electronics um, let me let me squeeze in something up top here so I can get all these gates on one screen you will you will also see a uh, a gate called a NAND gate It says N-A-N-D, it's a NAND gate. And that is uh, actually, uh, so it's schematic symbol, looks like an AND gate with a bubble on the outside, on the or in the output side. And that is equivalent to an AND gate followed by an inverter. So that's an a regular AND gate followed by an inverter, and that's an AND. So you take the AND truth table, and you invert the output, and you get a NAND gate. There's also a uh, NOR gate. Right, so a NOR gate would be an OR gate. Uh, it's actually just an OR gate with a bubble on the output. And that equals uh, a, a, an OR gate followed by an inverter. Okay, so you invert, you invert the OR truth table output and, and you get the NOR gate. So those are, these are uh, common logic gates that can be implemented in either hardware or software. And and they <laughs> will show they will help you make decisions based on the inputs, like I talked about in the car starter example. Okay. Uh, so if you have any questions about these gates, definitely uh, you know speak up now or or uh, shoot me a chat. And what we'll do next is we'll talk about we'll start putting these gates together to build uh, uh, m more complex, more useful expressions. And to do that, I just want to write down a Boolean expression and then implement it, okay? So these are the gates you should know. I'll erase these now and let's use them. So let's talk about implementation of Boolean expressions. So that's a long way of saying, if you have something like an equation, this is D equals A plus B inverse times C, right? This is just an example. And let's suppose you have uh, logic integrated circuits. I'll show you a picture of these. Uh, uh, on your bench, on your desk, and you want to implement this expression, which does something uh, that, that you want. Um, what I like to do when I'm, when I'm converting from this expression to actual logic gates is, is I'll start at the end. So I'm going to start on the right here. I'm going to say, at the output, I want D, uh, which equals A or with B inverse ended with C. Okay, so I want to create that at that at that wire right there. Um, well, we're actually going to be doing sort of the order of operations backwards. 
the order of operations for these logical expressions, Boolean expressions, is the same as you would expect for algebra. Maybe one of the differences is the inverse. You, you take that inverse first before you and it with C. But, but I think you'll catch on uh, pretty quickly here. So the last operation you would do in, in handling these logical var variables is the OR. So, so you would have an OR gate. It's a bad OR gate. There's an OR gate. And the input to that OR gate would be A and B inverse times C. Okay. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to work backwards. We're trying to work backwards to an input where we just have A, B, and C over here so that A, B, and C would be connected to the sensor, the switches, you know, whatever it gave, gave those inputs. Okay, so we're, we're already back to A, so we can kind of we can draw a line back here and say, yeah, we're, we have input A handled. Okay, so now let's handle the B inverse uh, anded with C. So you're going to use an AND gate to do that. So this is an AND gate. And at one input, you would have B inverse. At the end, other input, you'd have C. And so we've handled C all the way back to its input. And to get uh, B inverse, well, you use an inverter, logical inverter, right? So now you have B. So to get this expression uh, on the right here, this is how you would do that with logic gates. Okay. All right. Um, there's another, uh, I guess, thing you, you want to be able to handle, kind of a, a problem you want to be able to handle with logic gates, and that's being able to look at an expression or, or prove for a more complicated expression that, that expressions are equivalent, right? Kind of like in algebra, you can, you can factor an equation, and it's still the same equation, right? What that lets you do is implement circuits, uh, logic circuits, or even software code to be able to simplify the expression so it runs faster or its hardware is cheaper, or whatever. Um, you, you can do that with, with a truth table. So a truth table not only defines what a logic gate does, but it's actually a tool to show that expressions are equivalent. So let's do that. Let's, let me, I'm gonna take this down. And let's show a demonstration of using a truth table to prove that two expressions are equivalent. Uh, let's say that, that you and I are working on a project and we have to make a decision. We have, we have two input variables, A and B. And what we want to do is, is, is have, have some output. And let's suppose that expression is this. Let's say I have a uh, here's an example. Let's say I say, hey, we need this, uh, this expression that is A ORed with B. And uh, multiplied by the quantity A inverse ORed with A ANDed with B. Okay. And so that's an expression. And and you say, hey, I can simplify that. I think that we don't really need A. We don't really need A in this expression. You say that really all that matters logically, think about it, is, is B. And then we're going to set off to prove that. We're going to set off to say that this expression on the left, this comp more complicated one, uh, actually is equivalent to just looking at the variable B, and let's prove that. We're going to do that using a truth table. And so the, the truth table uh, would look like this. You would list both inputs, just like we always have been doing. And so let's do that. And it's going to be a fairly wide truth table. And what you can also do with the truth table is not list the only the output, but you can list intermediate terms. So I'm going to have here my inputs. And to the right of my inputs, I'm going to list some intermediate terms. 
And the first term might be, well, let's evaluate the leftmost parentheses here, A ordered with B, right? So that's going to be our first output. We still have to list all possible combinations of inputs. So here's 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So I've just started with 0, counted up in binary until I filled my bits with 1s. So now, to evaluate that intermediate term, I or A with B. So if you go back to the truth table, or you just ask yourself, is either or both true of my inputs? Uh, this would be a zero. This would be a one here. Zero ord with one is a one. One ord with a zero is a one. One ord with a one is a one. Okay, and we can keep working along here. Let's break this right-hand parentheses in, in this expression into uh, a couple terms. So we have A inverse. Let's invert A and write it down. So A inverse would be 1, 1, 0, 0, right? I've just inverted A. Uh, let's do this other term. The next term in that group, that parentheses uh, term, is A anded with B. So let's do that. It's A and with B. So are both true. That's the only way you get a 1. So this would be a uh, 0 here, right? 0 anded with 1. This is 0. 1 anded with 0. 1 anded with 1. You get a 1. Okay. Uh, and so now we can put these two right terms together to figure out what that parentheses value is. And we have uh, a inverse ord with a, B. So this breaks that term into a couple inputs for that one term. Here, here you have them right here. So A inverse ORD with A, B. Right? One ORD with zero, that's a one. A inverse ORD with A, B. Uh, again, you get a one. Oops. A inverse, uh, or yeah, A in inverse ORD with A, B here, you get a zero. And then a zero ORD with one, you get a one. All right, so you can see how I'm progressing through this. Finally, we can write the final expression. Uh, let's write it out here. A plus B multiplied by A inverse plus AB. All right. And now we look at, uh, let's see, this column, those are the inputs to this right term, and this column, those are the inputs to the first term, the input that represents the first term, and I and those, I'm making my conjunctions normally into a, into a verb here, uh, I and those together, zero and one uh, is zero. Uh, one and one is one, one and zero, is zero, one and one is one. Okay, and so now let's go back to the original question. Do I really need to implement this more complicated logic in order for us to get the answer? Remember, we're trying we're trying to perform some function, make some decision. I said we need this. You said no, we just need b, and we're trying to prove to ourselves that we only need b. And if you look at the two columns here, right? Those two, column, those two columns, they're the same. So for all possible combinations of inputs, this more complicated expression equals the, the B input alone. Okay. So there are, th this is one way to do it. This is how you can prove that Boolean expressions are equivalent. Uh, it, it is one way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. In fact, another way you could do it is uh, multiply you could use the rules just like algebra to multiply out these two these ter two terms. And there's some rules that we're not really going to go over, but if you can imagine that you can imagine that a ord with a inverse uh, would equal one, right? Because if if a is zero, uh, then a inverse is one, and so it's always going to be one. And if a is one, a inverse is zero, it's always going to be a one. So you can use uh, you can use rules like that once you expand this and and you would also see that okay that's equal to b that's another way to do it this is a little more uh illustrative of that 
and it also shows you for more complicated expressions you could you could prove this you could use this to prove your your point okay so so let's let's get on to doing something useful with these circuits let's actually create a circuit that that makes a decision okay so when you when you create something out of nothing in electrical engineering, you create a logic circuit, you create a filter, you're, it's usually called synthesis. So synthesis means we're going to um, start with a definition of what we want, and we're going to synthesize, create a logic circuit from that specification, from that definition. Okay. So I'll erase this. Okay, and let's let's talk about uh, synthesis of logic circuits. Okay, let's suppose uh, you and I have to design a circuit that does something. And it has three inputs. So it has three inputs here. And it also has uh, an output, of course, it has an output D. And what we, we've, we've reasoned, we've talked about it. You know, this might be the key is turned, the airbag is deployed. Uh, the car is in neutral or something like that. That's what that's what these variables represent on the input side. Uh, on the output side, it's what you and I decide we want the logic circuit to do, right? It is we want to turn the starter or not. This isn't going to be that example. This is going to be a little more arbitrary, but but the idea is we have all possible combinations of inputs, and you and I are going to decide based on what we want the circuit to do. We decide that, or you're told that what the output should do so that can be expressed in in a in a table like this right in this truth table so let's let's do that let me list all possible combinations of inputs for these three variables so we'll get more than four here more than four rows zero one so i'm starting with zero and just counting up in binary One zero zero. Okay. So we've listed all possible combina uh, combinations of inputs, and we're sitting around a, uh, a conference room table, and we're we're deciding. Okay, when the starter is when the key is turned and the airbag is deployed and whatever, we we want that to be uh, a true here. It's whatever you want the circuit to be to do, and then uh, under this case of inputs, no, we 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 don't want something to happen, right? Or and and I'm just filling these in with example values. Um, and this would be our, our specific application. You know, we don't want anything to happen. We do want something to happen. We do want something to happen. Okay. And so let me let me keep these straight. I don't know how straight they are on the screen on your video screen, but I'm drawing these blue lines just to keep the table straight. It doesn't really differentiate uh, between groups of inputs. Okay, so we have this. We've made we've made the the decisions on the design, and now we want to implement this in a logic circuit, either hardware or software. Okay, that's what synthesis is. So let's do this now. Let's let's take uh, this information. And let's use two different techniques to create this logic circuit. The, the first technique I want to show you is called the sum of products implementation. Okay, so it's the sum of products implementation. Um, and the kind of the one line summary on how to do this is is to concentrate
on the rows for which the output is a one. Now, this will make a little more sense as we get into it. So I'm going to concentrate on where D equals a one, and I'm going to make that happen with a sum of product terms. Let me show you what I mean here. Uh, so what I want is I, I'm going to have D, right, my expression is D equals something. And once I have an expression, I can create that from logic gates. But D equals something. And this is going to be the sum of products. So inside each one of these parentheses is going to be a product. And in between these groups of products, I'm going to have a sum, right, an OR gate, if that is. And I'll just write a few of these out here, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So there's a, there's a term in the parentheses in each one of these, and they're summed together. And that plus is an OR gate. So here's what that means. If any one of these terms in parentheses is true, that forces D to be a 1. So all I have to do is I have to make, for the rows for which the output is a 1, I have to force one of these terms to be a one. Okay, and I'm going to do that with a product term. So let's do that for this particular table. So I'm going to say uh, D equals, and we're going to go through each one of these rows and figure out wherever there's a one, how do we make that row a one with a product term? So for this first row here, I have 0, 0, 0 as all, all of my inputs. And I want to make a 1 happen with a product term. So what I would do is I would invert A. I would invert B. I would invert C. And I would multiply them together. So if A, B, and C are all zeros, then the inverse of A is a 1, the inverse of B is a 1, and the inverse of C is a 1. So I've anded together three 1s. I will get a, a 1 out of that. If that's one of these terms in D that is ORD added, added with other terms, I've forced D to be a 1 no matter what the rest of the terms are, right? It's all in, these are all inputs to an OR gate. So if one input to an OR gate, right? let's say it's a multiple input OR gate, uh, were a, a one, it forces the output to be a one. Okay. Um, okay, so we have forced, for the, for the first combination of inputs, the output's going to be a one. And, and, and uh, so yeah, now, what I could also show is that if, if you go through each one of these rows, A inverse, B inverse, C inverse, all and it together, that, that uh, you would actually get a, a zero out of that term, okay? Because if you have a one as A, B, or C, which is true for the rest of the rows, you're going to have a zero in here, and that's going to cause that product, that term, to be a zero. Okay. So let's keep going here. Uh, that's my first term. I have to scan down this table and find the next row for which the output is one. Zero, one, zero of A, B, C should cause a one at D. Okay, to make that happen in a product term, I have to invert A, I have to leave B alone, and I have to invert C. I'm going to invert A, leave B alone, and invert C. So for that row, for that set of inputs, and only that set of inputs in this table, this term will evaluate to a 1. It doesn't matter what the rest of the terms are doing. They'll all be zeros, but it doesn't matter what they're doing. That'll force D to be a one. So that's why we concentrate on D equals one to force the, 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 the entire uh, addition here to result in a one for D. Okay, keep going down. Here's a row for which the output is one, 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 zero. So I have to leave A alone, leave B alone, invert C. And so for this row down here, you get a one. And uh, for this last row, right, one, 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 I leave A alone, B alone, and C alone. I do not invert them. Okay, so this right here, try to circle this here, is an expression that you could create out of inverters and AND gates and OR gates 
and make this table happen. So we sat around the conference room table, we, we reasoned out that this is what we want. Now you have an expression that you could go use either in hardware or software to go build this. Okay. Now this is, this is clearly, this can be simplified. We're not going to, we're not going to go into how to simplify this. You could Google that and you could look up things like Carnot maps and just reducing this expression um, all right, by, by, by multiplying it out and, and factoring. Um, you could reduce this to minimize the number of gates you need and, and uh, that's possible. Okay. Uh, and, and I want to say this, I have like a, you know, a multi input or gate here. Right. So let me say if you have something like X or with Y or with Z, um, you could put parentheses around two of these and I could have right X or with Y uh, or with Z. Right? So this first or gate is is doing this first parentheses or and the second one is doing the right, the final or with Z, it, you, you, can, you can equivalently write that as a three input or gate X, Y, Z. I just want to throw that out there. So if you were questioning, well, wait a minute, how do you implement three inputs? Okay, that's how you could do that. There are also three input and four input or gates that you could buy on a chip, but you could also do it with two inputs. Okay. Okay, um, so let me erase this little digression here. Um, go back to the sum of products. What you'll see, in fact, in the homework problems, you'll see some examples that this is actually uh, written, so this expression is actually written as a sum of uh, what they call min terms, min term. So each one of these terms is a min term. And the, the way to interpret that is this. If I go back to these uh, all possible combinations of inputs, oh, I lost my screen here. Um, if I go back to all possible combinations of inputs and I look at that table, my truth table, and I, and I index these, I say this is zero, one, this is like an N index value, two, three, four, six, seven. Then I can, I can uniquely categorize, classify each one of these inputs uh, or, or relate it to one of these index numbers. And so D would equal the sum, right, the sum of products of min terms. Okay, and the min term is a little script M there. And so you'll see, let's see, you list the rows for which the output is one. Okay, six and seven. So you'll see that in the book. I, I typically use the, the, I like to visualize this as and and or gate. So I usually use the, what I have box here, but you can use that too. Okay, I mentioned there were two ways to do this. At least two ways, I'm showing you two ways. This is the sum of products. There's also the product of sums. Product of sums. And well, it's exactly that. It's a product of some terms and you will concentrate on the, the rows, the set of inputs for which the output is zero. So concentrate. I'm in a running conversation with the maker of this, uh, this document cam. Uh, with the company and they're trying to figure it out because they don't have any more to sell. I'd get a new one, but they don't have any more to sell. Everybody bought these for lectures. So concentrate on D equals zero. Um, and so let's show how that works. So if I have D equals a product of sums, let's say each one of these, ter the, these terms in parentheses is a sum dot, dot, dot. If I make any one of these terms in parentheses a zero, that would force D to be a zero, right? So if this first term is a zero, it doesn't matter if the rest are ones. It doesn't matter. You'll get D equals zero because they're all anded, right? 
multiplied together. So let's take that approach. Let's, let's figure out what terms we need, right? What some terms we need uh, from this table to create a zero uh, at the output. So you come down your table and you figure out, well, let's work on the first one, the first row for which the output is one. And cause that, make that uh, set of inputs cause a zero in this term. So if I leave A alone, I OR it with B, I OR it with C inverse, right? Uh, Right, I would have zero, ORed with zero, ORed with the inverse of one, zero. You zero ORed with zero, ORed with zero. That produces a zero in that term, okay? And so you keep going down here, down your table. So zero, one, one. How do I add those together, OR those together, and create a zero? I leave A alone. I invert, invert B, I invert C. A plus B inverse plus C inverse, right? So if I have, let's see, zero, one, one, I get zero, zero, zero there. So that will force a zero. And it doesn't matter what the other terms are doing. Uh, you're anding a zero with the other terms and that will cause them to be zero. So you keep going down here, one, zero, zero. I'd have to invert A, leave B alone, leave C alone. Okay, and then finally down to index five here, invert A, leave B alone, invert C. Okay, so this right here is another way to implement this truth table with AND gates, OR gates, and inverters. Clearly it must be equivalent, right? So you could rearrange this expression, multiply all these out, and then get this expression up top, that would work. Uh, this is just another way, another way to uh, implement this truth table. These are equivalent. Okay. Uh, these are called uh, max terms, each one of these terms, max terms. And what you're doing is you're expressing D as a product of terms, right? So you'd say equivalently, you'll see this in the homework answers, I think. D equals the product, big pi, right? Big pi is a, so big um, sigma is the sum, big pi is a product, and a max term is a capital M here. And so you'd represent the max terms, right, as their index here. So one, three, four, five is, is another way to express uh, this truth table and an expression that describes it, okay? So, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. You can take, you can make this decision. You can have as many variables as you want at input. You make the decision, okay, the airbag's deployed, so I don't, I want this to be a zero, don't turn, or the airbag's not deployed, the key's turned, and the car's in neutral, so yes, make the starter motor turn. Then you can take that, what you decided, or what is given to you, and create a, a Boolean expression. And as I showed earlier, you can take this, eh, probably minimize it a bit. I would Google how to do that. And, and then create uh, hardware or software that does that. Okay. All right. Um, so, and what I want to do next, I want to show you, let, let's make this connection. Let's make the connection between, okay, I've, I've seen these gates. Um, I've seen how I can do something with them. I can create a truth table. But how, how does that relate to transistors? Now, you often do not go out and create from scratch if you want a logic hardware circuit. You often do not go out and buy transistors and create a circuit board and create your own logic gates. You can, you can can buy integrated circuits that do this for you and they're very fast and they're optimized they use low power but I think it does help to kind of look inside these integrated circuits and and, and see how it works so I'm going to do that now and again if you have any questions happy to uh, uh, you know sh shoot out a chat or 
or break radio silence here. Um, so let me bring up some slides. So you won't see them yet, but you will in a second. Okay, so you should be able to uh, see a slide that uh, you should be able to make full screen and no video. Um, and it says introduction to microcontrollers. And so this is going to be a start of the microcontroller discussion, but we're gonna finish up logic circuits here. Um, what I wanted to do is I want to take you from transistors to gates. That shows you how you could you could implement or how manufacturers could implement what we just talked about and then i want to take you from gates to math operations like an addition just a binary addition adding two numbers together and i think what that does is that bridges the gap with it, for how how do you how do you go from transistors to doing math right how a microcontroller does math operations and a microcontroller consists of uh, or a microprocessor consists of transistors so how the heck do you go from saturating a transistor or not saturating a transistor to adding two plus two and so in about three or four slides I'm going to do that I'm going to show you how to do that so here is uh, let's go from transistors to to gates first um, so if I want to implement an OR gate, here's how I could do that. This this is a way, this is a way to do that. Two NPN transistors, bipolar junction transistors, we've talked about these. Um, assume that this, this resistor is designed such that when you apply a logical one, like five volts or six volts or three volts, when you apply a logical one to uh, A or B, uh, then it would saturate the corresponding transistors. So if you apply a zero to A, for example, this transistor would be in cutoff, meaning no collector current flows. And if you apply uh, five volts to A, then that would saturate this transistor and you would have 0.2 volts or less uh, across collector to emitter, right? What we talked about using a transistor as a switch. Okay, so let's look at this. I'm claiming this is an or gate. So you have a power supply voltage, a node voltage, that line should be connected there. There's a node voltage up top, um, uh, right, applying a voltage to the collectors of these transistors. So let's just look at transistor A. If you have transistor A uh, at uh, zero volts, a logical zero, then the transistor is in cutoff and no current flows through it. If you have input A at five volts, we're gonna assume this transistor is uh, saturated. So you have a little voltage drop there. So there's a, if you did a KVL, you would find that you have uh, between five and six volts at this output node voltage, right? Because because uh, current's flowing, it's flowing through that resistor, you'd have a voltage here. And your KVL would show you that you'd have six volts minus VCE, that would be at your output node voltage. Okay, the same thing for B, it's the same setup, it's connected to the power supply and the output at the emitter. And if B is energized or uh, set at five volts, you saturate that transistor. So you would have uh, six minus its VCE at the output. And the way this is configured, you can kind of notice that if either A or B is set to five volts, then you have only a, a small voltage drop VCE saturated connecting six volts to the output. If A and B are both zero volts, then both are in cutoff. This output is not connected in any way to six volts. Essentially, those are open switches. And the output is connected to ground zero volts through a 4.7K ohm resistor. So, so in this way, if either A or B are true, or both, the output is high. If A and B are zero, right, they're, if they're both zero, then the output is low. So this is an OR gate. That's how you could build this on a breadboard or in simulation um, as, a, uh, uh, as a gate. 
probably wouldn't do that. I'll, I'll show you what the chips look like that do this. But again, I want to connect, I want to connect transistors to gates and then gates to math operations to show you, well, you can actually do addition with transistors. So another, uh, uh, another example is an AND gate. So in this case, same assumptions when five volts is applied to the logical input, that corresponding transistor is saturated. Okay, so in this case, uh, if A is zero, then no current flows through transistor A. If B is zero, no current flows through transistor B. So you actually have to, to get current to flow through these transistors uh, uh, down through this 4.7K ohm resistor, you'd actually have to have both saturated. Right? A and B would have to be saturated to get current to flow down. If either of these is in cutoff, then it's essentially like an open switch and there's no connection between the output and six volts. The output is only connected to ground through the 4.7 K ohm resistor. So this is an AND gate. Both inputs have to be true in order for the output to be true. If either or both are false zeros, then the output is low. So that's an AND gate, okay? So let's try this. Um, uh, uh, this isn't a real clicker because you don't have your clickers, but, but take a look at this example. Um, you have a transistor, you have an input, you have an output defined for you. What kind of logic gate is implemented here? Is it an OR gate, like we talked about? Is it a buffer? Now a buffer, we didn't draw a buffer, but a buffer is essentially the output equals the input. Well, why would that be useful? It, it's usually used in a case where the output of a chip can provide a lot more current than whatever is providing its input. In other words, if you had a microcontroller with a, an output pin that can only supply five milliamps and you need 100 milliamps, there are chips that are like uh, buffers that, that can do that. It would be drawn like a buffer. So a buffer is output equals input. Is it an AND gate or is it an inverter? Okay, so take a look at that. Take you know 10 seconds and or 30 seconds to figure that out. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this. Um, uh, so let's look at this from the perspective of let's make the same assumptions. If there's five volts applied to the input over here, that that transistor is saturated, um, and if zero volts is applied, the transistor is in cutoff. So if you apply zero volts, uh, this transistor is in cutoff. That means there's no connection essentially between the output and ground, but the output is connected to five volts through a 10K ohm resistor. And if you're not taking any current or negligible current out of the output, uh, V equals IR would say there's zero volts across that 10K ohm resistor or close to it. So the output would be five volts. So when the input is zero, the output would be five volts. Uh, likewise, if the input is five volts, then this transistor is saturated. You have some low VCE value, 0.2 volts or probably less, and the output would be, again, 0.2 volts or probably less equal to VC, VCE here. Uh, yes, you would have uh, about 4.8 volts or more across this 10K ohm resistor, and you would have current flowing down through that resistor down to ground, you use a little bit of power there. But the function of this would be to take zero volts, convert to five volts, or five volts, convert to zero volts. So that's what this is doing. Again, looking at each one of these, right? we talked about those cases, uh, this would be a logical inverter. Okay. So I've taken you from uh, uh, transistors to logic gates. Now let me take you from logic gates to math operations. Okay, let's suppose we want to add numbers add binary numbers. 
If you can add binary numbers, you can add decimal numbers because you could do the conversion. So this circuit here is what is called a half adder. The input bits are on the left, and I'll talk about both. There are two output bits on the right. One is called the sum, one is called the carry. And it consists of an XOR gate and an AND gate. And so this table shows what happens uh, for all possible combinations of inputs. Right? The S is the sum. Let's concentrate on the sum versus inputs for now. So zero plus zero is a zero. Uh, and that's what the that's what the XOR is doing for you. Zero plus zero is a zero. One plus zero is a one. Zero plus one is a one. And one plus one is a zero. Well, what the heck is that? A, a, a one plus one is two. It's not zero, right? Well, here's why it's zero. One plus one for a given bit is zero because you need two bits in order to represent the value two. So if I draw this out on the right here, so uh, one plus one uh, is actually two, but you need two bits in order to represent a two. Well, this is a one bit adder, that's what it does, it's a half adder, but what it does is, is, is it gives you a carry output. So one plus one is zero for this bit, carry the carry bit over to the next column, the next uh, digit here. And then if, if these two bits were zero, you would get a one. Okay, so that's what the carry does for you. It carries over to the next bit. This is also why that the, the uh, XOR gate is called a modulo two adder. Right? It's, it's, it's adding bits and it's modulo two because, well, it, 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 it gives you essentially a modulo two output. One plus one is, is a zero. Modulo two, uh, two is a zero. Okay. Well, that's useful for adding one bit. What if you have more bits to add? You have bigger numbers than one and zero. You would use a full adder. So the full adder takes in A, B, right, those are your two input bits, and a carry. And uh, it involves more gates, a couple XOR gates, a couple AND gates, and an OR gate. This is the truth table for that. The inputs are A, B, and, and carry, because you have a carry input. And you also have outputs, and your, your sum is what you really want out of this. You're trying to add two numbers, you want the sum for that bit, but there's also a carry out. So that carry out would go on to the next bit. So you would have maybe an adjacent, another full adder for the next digit, for the next binary digit, uh, and it would take the carry in from the previous full adder. So let's take a look at this. It makes, makes sense that uh, if you just look at A and B, when the carry in is a zero, you get what you would expect. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 1 is 0, but carry the 1. But remember you have another input here, you have the carry in. So the sum not only shows the result of A and B, but it shows the result of adding in A, B, and C, all of those together. And then it gives you the corresponding carry out. Okay, so so you can you can imagine you have to add 16 bit numbers. You could use a half adder for the first bit, and the remaining 15 bits uh, you could use these full adders. Okay, so uh, so that's how you go from gates to math operations. Well, I just showed you you can go from transistors to gates. So you can imagine each one of these is created out of transistors, and then you could put those together so that you could actually do math, you could do an addition uh, using, uh, using transistors, okay? Now, um, would, would, would you do that? Uh, you know, probably not. Um, uh, you, you, would probably, you would probably use a specialized integrated circuit like a microcontroller or a microprocessor, un unless you really needed to add two numbers really fast and that's the only thing that your circuit board does. But um, more than likely you would, you would uh, in hardware, not use transistors to build up these gates. You'd probably use a microcontroller. Let's, let's slowly step into that using um, integrated circuits. Let me, let me finish up the, 
uh, logic integrated circuits before we go on to a, a break. Uh, these are logic integrated circuits right here. These chips, these are uh, plastic packages probably. And, and they have built into them their, their gates. They have transistors. So this is an example of a NAND gate. This chip, this integrated circuit, has uh, four NAND gates in it. And so you'll see their symbols here and where they're connected to, which pins they're connected to. And you'd also see the VCC is power for this chip and ground is ground for this chip. And that's what, that's what powers the chip. And then you would apply, let's say for this first gate up here, your inputs would go to pin one and pin two, and your output would come from pin three. And so that would follow the truth table of a NAND gate. And then you have four available. Um, this would be a, a logical inverter. So there are six logical inverters on this 14 pin chip. You power it and you apply the input where you want to and you get an output for that corresponding gate. These are combinatorial logic chips. I just want to mention there are, there's another family of logic called sequential logic. So combinatorial logic has no memory. It doesn't depend on what happened in the past. Sequential logic does depend on what happened in the past. For example, a counter. A, a counter that's counting maybe rising edges of a pulse cares about what its previous count was. That's memory. So, so this counter has to know at the time an event happens that it's counting, what was my previous count, and then increment it. There are chips out there that do that. And you can do things like clear the clear the count or set the count or uh, just just count rising edges or falling edges uh, of a digital waveform. So they're out there. We're, we're not going to talk about this other than this, but but each each of these um, integrated circuits performs a specific logical operation. Okay, and you you create higher level functions like the functions that we synthesized um, by wiring pins together. You could do that on a breadboard, you could do that on a circuit board. Um, and if you, if you need a different type of function or if you run out of gates because you only have uh, six inverters here, then you add another integrated circuit so your board gets bigger. The advantages are this, that if you have, if you only need a few logic gates, then these are inexpensive and you can wire them together, they're easy to use. Uh, the disadvantage is this, that if you need to add a bunch of numbers together, this is probably not the way to do it. If large packaging, there's a large amount of circuit board used that makes your packaging bigger. Um, it's not easily programmable uh, once you've programmed it because you have to move wires or cut circuit board traces or design another circuit board. So advantages and disadvantages to this. Okay, but this is basically how you would construct a simple uh, logic circuit using integrated circuits, and and they're used. They're, it's it's not like everything has gone to microcontrollers or, or microprocessors. These are used. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do now, before we go on to microcontrollers, uh, let's take a break, and so um, we're we're gonna we're gonna continue on the digital topic. And then we're going to move to microcontrollers, which involves some, some software. So let's take a 10-minute break. My clock says 514. So let's come back at uh, – let's round up to 515. Let's come back at 525, and we will resume with microcontrollers. So I'll go on, on mute, and I'll see you at 525. What I'd like to do uh, is, is transition from – in uh, logic circuits over to microcontrollers. So you should see my screen right now that says logic integrated circuits, and now it says microcontrollers and microprocessors. So um, let's let's talk about microcontrollers. So this is a microcontroller. It's an integrated circuit. It has many more pins than you would expect on a logic chip, um, and typically they are mounted on some circuit board. You don't use them alone. They're on some circuit board. And this is an example development board uh, with its supporting electronics for that microcontroller. And microcontrollers and microprocessors have software definable functions. So microcontrollers and microprocessors are very similar. Uh, typically, you use 
as the name implies, a microcontroller to control something and to sense uh, the physical world to control something in response to that. Microprocessors are generally for, well, processing. So crunching numbers and even, even playing games is, is crunching a lot of numbers. These are software definable versus a logic integrated circuit, which is hardware definable because you have to wire pins together. You typically use a PC to create software and then you download the instructions that you create uh, based on that software into the microcontroller's memory. And the microcontroller can implement a large number of uh, lo logic functions, uh, sequential or combinatorial, and branching functions and loops. So uh, it has a much higher capacity than y you could implement with discrete integrated circuits. So microcontrollers generally have more peripherals compared to microprocessors, uh, but they're usually slower. So microcontrollers, you can you can sense temperature, you can sense pressure in, indirectly. You need a sensor out there, but you can build a scale. Um, and then microprocessors, you crunch numbers quickly. Okay. Microcontrollers generally have much slower clocks. We'll see that a clock is is a is a signal that synchronizes the operations that happen within the microcontroller and the microprocessor. Microcontrollers might have clocks on the order of megahertz, maybe tens of megahertz. Microprocessors have clocks on the order of well, gigahertz plus. The advantages are they're inexpensive to implement numerous functions. They're reprogrammable with software, um, and, and they're in a small package. Uh, the disadvantage is, well, if you need just a few logic functions, then they are uh, overkill. So if you need an AND gate, you wouldn't use a, a, a microcontroller. Um, and they're relatively slow compared to logic gates. So you could have a logic gate respond in uh, nanoseconds, and a microcontroller might take microseconds to respond to produce a result. So it depends what speed you need. Um, and, and so, um, Let's talk about embedded systems. Embedded systems uh, have hardware and software, some kind of processing hardware, electronic hardware, that forms a component of, of a much larger system, of some overall larger system is expected to function without the need for human intervention, maybe except for a human machine interface. The, the uh, processor of an embedded system typically supports the operation of the product, but it's not the main reason for having the product. So in, in a PC, the main reason to have a PC is to compute, to use your spreadsheets, to use MATLAB, to play games, to create a Word document. All of that is, is really computing when you get behind the scenes. The, the processor of embedded system is like, like in your refrigerator. You really usually don't care about the processor in, the ref your refrigerator. You don't ever see like the number one bu any bullet on the advertisement for a new refrigerator being we've got the fastest processor for this refrigerator. You know, you never see that because the processor is not the point of the product. It's there. It's necessary to keep your food cold and to turn the light on and to you know make make the ice come out. Um, but it's not the main point. That's usually what uh, an embedded processor is. So, you know, you can think about what products have sense and control functions. All of your appliances, maybe even your coffee maker, has a, a, an embedded processor in it. Um, and these microcontrollers that are used in embedded systems range all sorts of functionality and cost. They can be only a few pins. Uh, where you program them to do something very simple. They have, might have very few ports to control and sense uh, physical, uh, the physical world, quantities in the physical world. And they can range from a few pennies up to, uh, uh, up to dollars if you have a really feist, uh, fast microcontroller. You know, you might, again, I've been doing it, but contrast an embedded system to a personal computer. Right? You look at your computer, it doesn't sense all that much on its own. Uh, it'd be hard to hook a temperature control to it uh, directly. You could go through USB, but um, 
but a, a, uh, a microcontroller, it's, it's, it's really easy to connect uh, a sensor maybe with a support circuit that, uh, that senses temperature, senses pressure, and then controls something, controls a valve, controls a heater through a transistor maybe. Um, so you might think about uh, applications of microcontroller, all sorts of consumer electronics, appliances, vehicle and aircraft control and instrumentation, any product that senses and controls uh, probably has some sort of microcontroller in it or some integrated circuit that functions as a microcontroller. And let me mention that. Um, microcontrollers can be programmed, they can be, they can be reprogrammed. They are used in many products. Uh, sometimes if you're making a lot of copies of a product, you might start your design with a microcontroller. You might test it, test your logic, test your program, and then you might create a custom chip. Uh, some of those chips are called ASICs, application specific integrated circuits. So if you're stamping out 200 million cell phones, uh, it might be worthwhile to create your own chip. Um, and if you're creating maybe a thousand of a product or 10,000, it might make sense to use a, a microcontroller, which might be a little more expensive. But, but they all implement, uh, typically uh, an embedded system has some processor function in it uh, that could be uh, implemented with a microcontroller. Let's take a simple application. Let's take the application of a, a scale. So, so this is uh, a cartoon right, of a scale, block diagram of a scale. And so on the left, you want to apply a weight. You want to put a weight on a tray. And on the right, you want a display uh, of, the, uh, of the weight. And at the bottom here, you see grams and ounces. You have some human machine interface, some user interface uh, that is setting the the units and setting the zero of the scale. So this actually implements a lot of what we have talked about and, and will talk about. Um, let's go from left to right. So you have, you have a, a node voltage and a ground and that is powering this uh, resistive bridge right here. And so this bridge is like what we would call a load cell. Uh, sometimes a strain gauge is implemented like this. And you would have, so, so when you apply the weight, it actually, deflects, it bends, it, it deforms resistors, and that causes the resistance to go up or down just a little bit. And um, typically what you need is, is you need something in between uh, that sensor uh, and the rest of the circuit, right, to, to, to display the value. Let's talk about each one of these. Let's actually start at the microcontroller. So the microcontroller, We'll talk about it. It has ports that come in. Um, a port is just a, uh, a digital port is is either a uh, an input that senses is the output. Uh, I'm sorry, is the input a one or a zero, five volts or zero volts, right? Or or a port is an output that produces a voltage to make something happen outside of the microcontroller. Um, to the left here, I have an analog to digital converter, and they usually span uh, a volt to five volts that they could sense over their total span. And they have a finite number of levels that they can sense. For example, if you have uh, a 10-bit analog to digital converter, uh, two to the 10th is 1,024, uh, you, can have, you can sense 1,024 different levels between the range, the, the uh, edges of the range of the analog to digital converter. So to be accurate, you'd usually want your input to the analog to digital converter to, to span that, that voltage range, maybe one volt, maybe five volts, depends on the converter. Okay, so you need, this is where this amplifier comes in. This amplifier takes a small input voltage and multiplies it by 10 or 50 or 25, produces an output voltage so that the output of the sensor can span many levels of this analog to digital converter, maybe all the levels. Uh, but, but the point is you need gain here. Well, you've looked at this. You've looked at um, building amplifiers with op amps. Right? We can build a times 10 amplifier with a, an inverting or a non-inverting amplifier. So that's, that's a piece you, you know now. So working back toward the microcontroller, 
you have some inputs here, um, and then you want to light up this display. Maybe this is a seven segment LED display, and you can light up segments of this. This would be like an eight here. If, if all, or here's an eight. If all the set seven segments are lit up, so you need you might have a, uh, a a dedicated controller that lets you output a value from the microcontroller and light up the proper segments of that display. Okay, so so this is kind of this is the context of a of an application with a microcontroller. You have inputs, you have outputs, you have surrounding electronics, you have a user interface, you have some connection to the physical world, uh, both input uh, and output. Okay, so that's that's the application of scale. Let's take a look at what this microcontroller does on the inside. Okay, so let's kind of draw high-level block diagram of a microcontroller, and this is what it would look like. It consists of a brain. This is the brain, the central processing unit. Um, and there are connections from that CPU to other pieces. There's program memory, where you store your program. There's data memory, where variables get stored. Okay? There's input and output ports, right? That communicates uh, from maybe an external analog to digital converter or to a seven-segment display to display something. Okay, so that's, those are the connections. Here's the clock that I mentioned before. This clock is actually a, uh, it's a square wave or a rectangular wave. It, it, it usually um, oscillates between a low and a high and a low and a high, uh, whatever the logic levels are, are for this CPU and this microcontroller. Let's say it's five volts. And on every, uh, it depends on the controller, but maybe on every rising edge of the clock pulse, something happens in the CPU. So this keeps the keeps everything synchronized. It times the system. Okay. Um, well, let's let's talk about uh, a basic operation that might happen to show how each one of these blocks would work. So the CPU uh, is the brain, but it has to start somewhere. It has to start with your program. So what you would do is you would uh, you would on a PC, you would program. Um, let's say you want to add two numbers. One of your instructions says add two numbers together. Maybe that's one line in your program. Your program gets stored in program memory, and so starting at some point, let's just say memory location zero uh, uh, is the first instruction, and then sequentially you have other instructions. The CPU, once it's turned on, uh, might go out and look at Instruction number zero. And instruction number zero might be add two numbers that are located in data memory. Right? Just add two numbers. So over this, uh, over, over the bus, the CPU would get its instruction. It would see that it has to go add two numbers. And it knows that those two numbers are in data memory somewhere. So what it would do is out over these buses, these buses are essentially parallel wires that form the connection between these blocks. So uh, maybe one bit per wire. And so the CPU would go out to data memory and it would go grab the first number and it would put it in a register. A register is just a place to temporarily store, uh, store values. So it might put it in a register uh, available to the CPU. And then it would go out and get the second number that it has to add and it would put that in another register. And then it would execute the add operation. We talked about adding, how you do that with transistors. It has that built in here. And so it would add that those two numbers and then out over the bus, it would put the results in data memory. So here's the result that would be stored there. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, that's the flow of how uh, sequentially uh, one line of code would work in, in a microcontroller. And then you could have other instructions that would say, okay, I want to go turn a few LEDs on. So the CPU would go out and uh, sometimes these input and output ports are actually memory mapped, which means you go change a value in memory and that port, right, it either might output a high or a low at a pin, would change based on what you write to a memory location. So your program might say, turn LED number one on. So there's a bit that corresponds to LED number one that you've connected on the circuit board. The CPU would say, okay, I read that instruction. I'm gonna go out and set that, set that port high so that LED turns on, okay? Um, you could do more complex things like control 
digital to analog converters or read analog to digital converters. Uh, so this is the outside world here. So that is a very quick, very high level explanation of, of what's going on here. Again, if you many of you have uh, some experience, and if you don't, I'd encourage get get an Arduino and and do some um, do some, do you know some basic programming of it. And it they're they're really addicting, but this is basically what it follows. You program you program the Arduino. Uh, you can you can use variables, and they're stored in memory. You don't really have to know what's going on here. It just does it for you. The CPU does all your processing, and you can communicate with the outside world via the ports. Okay. So that's what's going on there. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, about these ports. So uh, the ports, digital ports anyway, are digital inputs and outputs that usually map to pins on the microcontroller. And they will have uh, input or output levels of three volts, maybe five volts, but those are digital inputs and outputs for the outside world. And they can also do some special functions, like they can trigger things that the microcontroller does. For example, you might, um, if you if you have a, a let's say, a, I don't know, uh, an electric bike, right? If you have an electric bike and you have a voltage sensor, hardware voltage sensor on the outside, you may want to, at the instant something happens to that battery, maybe it... Uh, it goes over voltage or it, it gets too hot. You might to want to trigger some special functions to like shut down your bike, right? Your battery is about to catch fire or you know, your something's gonna happen bad. So you might actually trigger functions off of these digital ports to have something happen fast that's not normal. Um, and that's called that's called an interrupt. Peripherals are special capabilities of the microcontroller. So you'll you'll hear this term peripherals things like built-in analog to digital conversion that's a that's a peripheral that can actually be built into the microcontroller you don't need an external chip to do that you could have one but you don't need one digital to analog conversion that's going from a number to a voltage right a digital number to a voltage can be done on some microcontrollers um, there are functions like timers um, really high resolution timers so you could time down to the microsecond uh, what's what's happening, uh, how long a pulse is. Uh, an example of that is you could you could build a universal remote control. So remote controls, infrared remote controls anyway, typically use pulse spacing and pulse duration of infrared light in order to differentiate between, you know, turn your TV on, turn your TV off, channel up, channel down, whatever. You can actually read inputs uh, like you could you could build out of two parts, literally two parts. You could on an Arduino, you could connect uh, an infrared sensor to an Arduino, and you could you could time, you could time down to the like the microsecond level, um, how long a, how long pulses were on, how long they were off. You could detect the whole pattern. So you could point your infrared remote control at your Arduino's you know infrared sensor that you hooked up, and capture the timing. And then you could replay that. So now you've built yourself a, you know, you could hook that to your home control system and control everything your house in your house that has a remote control based on infrared uh, using these timers. So there's some cool things that can be done. Communications interfaces are usually uh, built in, especially RS-232. USB usually takes some external hardware. Um, and then an important overlooked peripheral is a debugger that lets you step through lines of code to try to figure out why a program might not be doing exactly what you wanted it to do. So taking a, a look at a microcontroller, right, this, is, this is a lot more pins than the 14 pin chip I showed before. Uh, microcontrollers, uh, they have, may have more pins than this. They could have a hundred or more pins on them. This is a TI microcontroller, just as an example. You can see all these pins around it. You'll see uh, uh, VSS and somewhere I think you'll see VDD um, around here. Let's see VSS, it was VCC. And, and these are usually power pins and ground pins. All these other pins are, um, are just access to ports and peripherals. Right? So you can get to 
ports on this microcontroller in particular, you'll see over here it says P1.0. That's port, win, port 1, bit 0. Here's port 1, bit 1, port 1, bit 2. And you'll see that goes all the way up to port 1, bit 7. So there are 8-bit ports, right? Uh, each port has 8 bits, one byte. And you have, I think, uh, six, at least uh, five ports on this, I think. Let's see if there's a six around here. Um, and so you can control each one of those pins. Uh, some pins are shared. So you'll see you have a, uh, um, let's see, let's find an analog to digital converter somewhere around here. Um, you'll see that here's one. Port six, bit one, is also shared with an analog to digital converter input, A1. Um, and in fact, to here at the bottom, it's either a general purpose IO, just a digital pin you can control or sense, and an analog input for a 12-bit analog to digital converter. So you actually have to tell the microcontroller, like it has, it has more functions than it has pins. So you have to actually choose the functions you want to connect to the outside world, make that decision, and then you, you will be able to use a subset of functions. So here you would decide, do I want an input port? or do I want an analog to digital converter? Okay, so it just, just gives you kind of a um, information on this. It, let, me, let me back up and say, I'm giving you kind of a, an overview of microcontrollers. You, you don't have to memorize all this. You should, you should basically grasp that microcontrollers have ports. You can sense, you can control, analog, digital, um, they have peripherals. You don't have to dig in and be able to write C code or understand how these microcontrollers work. What I'm going to show you are some example problems where, okay, if you've got a microcontroller connected to some digital logic, connected to some LEDs or a motor, um, be able to work those types of problems, and I'll, and I'll work some examples. But before I get to those examples, I want to show you what's inside and how they work and that you can program them and uh, to output and input digital values. Okay, um, software is the way you control a microcontroller. You program its functions, and there are uh, different programming languages you can use. If you've used an Arduino, you used either C or C++. Not too long ago, C was used and not C++, but C++ is actually becoming more common for small microcontrollers. There's assembly language. Um, which is a very low level way to control a microcontroller. The output, so in order to go from C or C++ to code that the microcontroller understands, you use a compiler. A compiler pr produces machine code. So machine code is what actually gets loaded into that memory that I showed you, that program memory. That's why I had to show you that. This machine code, it's these are the ones and the zeros that that CPU goes out and grabs to execute instructions. Okay, that's you wouldn't you wouldn't practically write a program by writing machine code. Um, you typically use this higher level language like C or C plus plus. In between C and C plus plus, there's actually assembly language where you can almost directly produce the ones and zeros for machine code. So you have a list of instructions and, and to, to add two numbers, you might actually take several lines of code. You may have to go out and get, uh, you may have to get a number out of data memory, put it in a register, get another number out of data memory, memory put it in a register, perform an add instruction on that register and put the result somewhere out in data memory. So it may take you, it may take you multiple instructions to just add two numbers, which is why you don't do this too much, right? uh, assembly language. But sometimes if you have a super fast algorithm that needs to be run and you have a custom way of implementing ads and memory moves and things like that, you might need to use assembly language for extremely high performance. Typically though, you're working in the domain of C and C++, okay? So a compiler, as I mentioned, is what takes, and it's software in itself, it takes the C program or C++ and produces the machine code. And then you take uh, a PC that you're using to write the software, usually, and programming hardware uh, to download the code to the microcontroller. Okay. 
Let's take a look at a microcontroller board. Here is one, uh, an Arduino is also one. And they typically all have this. They have a microcontroller. Um, they have some kind of programming and power interface. They usually have some debug support, like an LED uh, that you can control and a switch that you can control on this kind of development board. So this is what you'd use, again, to, to develop, you know, to develop a product to get some software started before you actually had your product done. You can work on your software, you can interface. All of these pins right here are, are, are essentially connected, many of them, probably most of them on this board, are connected to the pins of this chip. So you have access to all the pins on that chip, to all these ports, um, to the power supplies, to the grounds. This is just some prototyping area over here. And Arduino board, the ones that I've worked with, don't have this. That's okay. You can add a breadboard or whatever. Um, but you have some prototyping areas. So it's common to kind of evaluate or judge if a microcontroller is right for your project or product by looking, well, how do I program it? What, what tools are available? Um, this one you can program and see. What voltages do I need? Uh, you know, if you have a, a five volt, a five volt sensor, you might want to use a five volt microcontroller. This one is actually only, um, only works up to 3.6 volts. If you apply five volts, that would be bad. You'd burn something out. Uh, this one has six digital ports. So six eight bit ports. It has eight analog to digital converters, two digital to analog converters, a couple timers, an on chip comparator. So it has a hardware comparator on it. Like we talked about some serial communications. So if you need more than eight ADCs, then this particular development board and chip is not for you. Um, and, or if you want to make this, your product super cheap and you don't need this many features, you could go to a, a, a lighter, um, more lightweight microcontroller. Kind of digging into the schematic, I want to show you what, what goes on on this board. Again, this is similar, similar to other boards, similar to the Arduino. Um, this big box, so when you have a complex chip, you don't usually have a unique symbol for it anymore. You have just a box. And that box has labels for each of the signals connected to it. Right? That's what these labels are inside this box. A chip designation um, is a U. So this is U1. So you'll see here, R. this is R32, this is U1. So U is the designator for a chip. And then here are all the pins connected to the outside world. This is the header that has all the pins that you can connect to. I kind of want to point out some things that you, you, you should be familiar with by now. Here's the power jack where it says 6 volts DC or 4.5 volts AC, right? Well, how the heck could you do that, AC or DC? Well, look at what you have here. You have um, a full wave rectifier. So here is, here's a set of diodes that form a full wave rectifier. Well, where's the capacitor? Here's the capacitor over here. So this is the capacitor that goes with that full wave rectifier. So that, yeah, that should look familiar. This happens to be a, it's got a power LED. So you've worked with um, diodes and a resistor. So you've actually, right, we've looked at a circuit. You put a diode in series with a resistor, you can control the amount of current through that diode with this resistor. So depending upon how bright you want this LED to be, you can control uh, that with this resistor. You can calculate that now. This resistor has a certain forward voltage that you could assume and you can do that. Um, okay, just pointing some things out that you can, uh, you should be familiar with. Here's, here's a voltage regulator. We haven't talked about that. Uh, if we have time, we'll talk about that. But you set the voltage based on this uh, voltage divider here. Um, so there's a, there's a voltage divider there. Here's some more capacitors. Here's a node voltage. This node voltage, right? Remember I, sh I showed uh, on some of the transistor schematics, I said, you know, you don't usually show the power source. You'll show a node voltage. Well, here at this microcontroller, there's a node voltage shown. That little arrow is just indicating it goes to a power supply. Wait, there's nothing connected. Well, actually, this is what power. So this, this whole upper piece here, right? This, this piece, you would you would represent, go back to the first week of class, this is represented by, could be represented by, a, an ideal um, independent voltage source. It's, it's regulated, it produces 3.3 volts for the rest of the circuit. It's always going to be 3.3 volts as long as you supply the current, as long as you uh, um, take current from this circuit 
within its normal bounds. You know, that might be 100 milliamps or whatever. But there's here's a schematic of a um, an ideal independent voltage source right here. You could build it. Um, what else do I want to point out? We're going to talk about this later, how to get user interface into a microcontroller. Um, and we're going to talk about this. How do you light this LED up when you have voltage on one side and a control on the other side? We'll talk about that. Just so just orienting you to some real, real schematics, real world schematics here. Okay. Um, sometimes you have to use a programmer. So in order to program a microcontroller, you write code on a PC and sometimes you use an external programmer. If you used an Arduino, uh, you essentially used an onboard programmer because the Arduino has a USB interface built into it. Um, but either way, you write your code, you download it to the microcontroller, you, you turn it on or you reset it, and then you debug your code. Okay, and this external programmer supports debug and programming. If you have an Arduino, that does it all on board. That's why they're so nice for prototyping. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk about um, kind of a more um, logical aspects of a microcontroller. Let's talk about number systems and digital input and output. Right, I kind of showed you. Here's I just showed you what's in a microcontroller and then some supporting electronics around it. Okay, suppose you have that. You have your Arduino. Um, how do you represent numbers in the Arduino? What limitations are you, are there on you for a uh, from a programming perspective? And then how do you use digital input and output? Um, here is how you represent integers with different data types. So each microcontroller and then each compiler might have different ways of representing integers. And there's different names for those types. So in other words, uh, if you have a, a short integer, you have a signed value, which signed means it could be negative or positive, and short, it means your integer is not that big. It's just got a few, uh, few bits. Um, and so if you use a signed short variable, you might declare in your program that this number is is uh, assigned short, that would mean you could represent a value between uh, negative 32768 and positive 32767. Okay, so th that would be able to be stored in 16 bits. Okay, and so 2 to the 16th is, is uh, what, 64,000, but you've got to divide that into 2 to go negative and positive 32,000 there. So that's how you would represent a, a, a signed. Uh, relatively short number. If you need a, a a big signed number, then you could use a signed long long. You could have 64 bits representing your number. That represents minus two to the 63rd to positive two to the 63rd minus one. Okay, so you can see there's a range of sizes you could use for your words. We talked about words. This is an 8-bit word. This is a 64-bit word. You can have signed. You could have unsigned, um, etc. So you got to pay attention to that because if you have to store a number that is 33,000, um, you cannot do that with a signed short. If you use all signed long longs, you might use up all of your memory, especially if you're using arrays of numbers in your program. So you got to pay attention to how much memory you actually have in your data memory. Okay. Um, well, what about floating point? Right? These are these are integers. These are um, integer values. So floating point uh, is a way to actually not define where your radix goes in a finite number of bits. When, when I was drawing a radix in a position in a word, that was fixed point. I said the radix is always here between bits two and three. That's called fixed point. Um, in computers, when you're doing computer programming like MATLAB, uh, it's, it's typically using floating point format. And floating point's kind of neat because it lets you represent a wide range of values. So in this particular floating point format, which is 32 bits, you have one bit that represents a sign, you have a word that represents the exponent, 
and you have a word that represents the mantissa. And the way to interpret that value is this down here. Negative one to the s, right? So if s is a, a zero, then your, your value is um, uh, positive, and if s is one, your value is negative. So there's your sign. Two to the exponent minus 127 times one point the mantissa. Okay, so that that lets you um, interpret what this value is. And, and it's a huge range. So you could have a range, if this is a variable you declared, you could have values as precise and small as plus minus one point something times 10 to the negative 38th, right, a really small fractional value, all the way up to a, a big value, three point something times 10 to the plus 38. So that's what floating point does for you. Okay, what are the disadvantages? Well, it takes longer to compute, um, to do computations in, in, the, in the microcontroller or microprocessor. So if you're just, if you're just using this as a scale, uh, that's okay. You can do your calculations with, with floating point. If you're doing some serious signal processing where you're sampling at a giga sample per second, like a billion samples per second, and you've got to multiply and divide and do all that stuff, well, then you're probably not going to use floating point because you have to do you have to do calculations in nanoseconds, not tenths of seconds. Or floating point's still fast. You can probably do floating point depending upon the processor in a few microseconds, but or or faster. But once you get up to nanoseconds or even faster, uh, this won't work. Okay. Okay. So I, I want to prepare you for if if you um, as you go on at CU, right, and maybe use a microcontroller for some of your projects, or if you use other, other hardware that has microcontroller-like interfaces, uh, let's talk about limitations on microcontrollers. So microcontroller inputs and outputs, their ports have limits, of course, on their allowable voltage and current, and exceeding these limits can either damage the microcontroller and maybe maybe even worse, uh, cause a very difficult debug condition in your microcontroller. So you know everything should work on paper; it works, but it's just not working. That can be a result of exceeding the limits of the input and output ports. And so, for an example, microcontroller, you can apply voltage to any pin. Uh, let's. I, the, let's say this voltage ranges, the power supplies to this microcontroller would be zero volts to VCC. This microcontroller will actually allow you to pl apply a little below ground, a little less than zero by three tenths of a volt, and then a little more than VCC by three tenths of a volt. So if you exceed the bounds of the power supplies too much on this microcontroller, you're gonna damage it. And that's, that's more of a damage condition. Um, the current, Output from port is probably more of a operation, kind of hard to debug condition. So this this um this particular microcontroller can output six milliamps. It can source right plus six milliamps, or it can sync six milliamps into itself, and uh, per port, and then forty eight milliamps total all ports. So if for example, you're not going to run, you're not going to power a 100 milliamp motor from a pin on this microcontroller because you can only output out of one port 6 milliamps. You're not going to power uh, um, 10 different LEDs at 5 milliamps apiece from these ports because you're limited to 48 milliamps. You'd need 60. So you got to pay attention to this when you're designing um, the hardware connected to the microcontroller. I'll show you a way. I'm going to show you how to add a transistor so that you can you can control a motor and you can control lots of LEDs. Um, okay. And in fact, let's let's talk about that next. Let's suppose you want to control a motor um, from a microcontroller from your Arduino. So here is a here is a. Uh, uh, a way to do that. So if your load, your motor, your light bulb, your heater, whatever, requires more current than a microcontroller can pr provide, one option is to use a transistor just like we've, we've talked about. Um, instead of a resistor or a diode, I'm going to show generically a load. So load is something 
that's using power. It's something you're trying to deliver power to, a motor, a light, whatever. Um, this is a configuration to do that. So on the left, I have the microcontroller digital output port. Let's say it's either zero volts or five volts. And you've designed this resistor to either saturate this transistor when you apply five volts or for this transistor to be in cutoff when you apply zero volts. So now you can control a larger amount of current through this load by using just a little bit of current. Like we're going back to that diagram I drew with the little pipe and the big pipe. You're, you're using the little pipe right, to control the current through the big pipe. This is exactly that. You might use one milliamp through the, from the microcontroller, just one milliamp or less, quarter milliamp, um, in order to control 100 milliamps through this load. Okay, so, so that's, that's a way to get around that limitation. There are specialized chips that can do this, so don't think this is the only way you can do that. Um, you can actually use some specialized integrated circuits. Uh, here's the part number of one that has all, they have all this built in. So I wanted to show this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, instead of designing your own transistor circuit, you might look around. Hey, there are essentially uh, seven transistor circuits uh, uh, built into this one chip. And I wanted to point out this, this looks like a logic inverter. It actually functions like a logic inverter, but it's doing a little more than that. It's actually letting you um, use a low current, low power input to control a big load on the output. So if in some future class you have to control a big light, a big, uh, you know, a relatively small motor, um, you could use a chip like this. So what this is showing that is if, if I actually apply a one, logic level one here to the input, this is an inverter, I get a logic level zero or ground at the output. If I apply ground at the bottom side of this load and it has power supply on the top side, you'll turn that load on. So if I apply a one, the input, the load will turn on, uh, just like the transistor circuit. Inside this chip is something that looks like this for each one of those channels, right? You have, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different inputs to control seven different outputs. Inside is actually this. You'll see two transistors, and this is called a, a, a Darlington pair or a Darlington array. And, um, What's happening here, we're not gonna study this, but just to tell you, if you see this, you're actually multiplying the, effectively almost, multiplying the betas of these transistors together. So you can use even less current into the input to control even more current through the output. This is, the exa this is an example of, of an open collector output. Remember I said open collector output. It's not uh, connected to anything. It's, it's, it's just connected to the collector of a transistor in this, case two transistors so so you so what this is doing is this is actually either connecting you to ground your circuit to ground or not or leaving it floating so that's an open collector output okay so this is how to control something uh, with a microcontroller a higher current load let's talk about getting input getting input from a uh, a switch let's say or a key on a keypad so if you, um, uh, if you have a switch and here is an input to a microcontroller, so that's meant to be a digital value, zero volts or five volts, let's say, to a microcontroller pin, and then you're gonna do some software uh, interpretation of that. Here's how you could do that. So VCC, let's say it's five volts, um, might be connected to a 10K ohm resistor to the switch to ground, and this is a pretty common way to do it. So um, if the, if the uh, switch is open, you have VCC connected to a digital input port through a resistor. Typically these ports uh, input very little current. They, they might be on the order of microamps or less. So that's essentially zero milliamps, zero current through that re resistor. So there's zero, by Ohm's law, zero voltage drop. So the input port, with the switch open, the input port would be VCC or five volts. When the switch closes, you're connecting the port directly to ground. Okay, and um, 
And that means the input port would be held to zero with the switch, zero volts. It would be a low, logic level low. And yeah, you'd have VCC on top of the resistor, zero volts ground on the bottom of the resistor, get some current flow through there. That's no big deal. Your microcontroller is still held at ground at the input. Okay, so, so a common way, again, to summarize is use the pull-up resistor between the input port and VCC, uh, use a switch to connect the port to ground, and then you are controlling the input port with a switch. If the switch open, switch is open, the microcontroller sees a logic level high, a logic level one. If the switch is closed, the microcontroller sees a uh, logic level zero, okay? Some folks ask, well, wait a minute, why, why wouldn't you just put the switch on top and the resistor on bottom? And the answer is some microcontrollers don't like to be, they don't like to have their input ports connected directly to VCC without a resistor. Um, uh, because of current uh, p potential current draw, um, and sometimes, sometimes if if you have a VCC, uh, maybe this is a VCC of another circuit, you you might you might go above the allowable voltage for that port. So it, it's done. It's done. But uh, the case where you switch the positions of the resistor and the switch, but a lot of times I I see this configuration. Okay. Um, I just want to mention debouncing a switch. Again, I don't want you to get in trouble with future future projects. If you have, let's say, a counter sensing how many times a switch was pressed, sometimes you press the switch once and your counter on your microcontroller in increments like three or five or six times. Why is that happening? And how do I cure that? How do I solve that? Well, mechanical switches are, are, are uh, they can have fluctuations um, in the connection when they are pressed or released. In other words, it may one press of a switch might look like multiple presses, and that's called a bounce. Um, they're pretty sloppy devices. They're two pieces of metal being pressed by a plunger, and and they're what I call scratchy. Um, a bounce can cause the microcontroller to sense that a switch has been pressed and released multiple times, and um, Here's an example. Let's suppose down at the bottom here, you have a threshold for detecting uh, a high or a low. I'm simplifying it here, but a, a threshold detecting high or low of a, of, of a digital port. And when you when you press or release your switch, you get this kind of behavior. Again, the, the, the contact is broken, but it's connected again and then broken. And finally, here it is. Um, your, your switch is actually switch states three times here. Your microcontroller might count three counts. There's a really easy way around this uh, in software. You detect the transition from the switch, and then you wait a little bit of a, for a fixed delay, and then you test the input again. You see if it's the same value as the transition, and then if the input remains the same, you accept it as a new a value. So that's kind of like detecting the first transition here, and then waiting a little bit, waiting a little bit until this uh, bounce stops, and then finally taking that new input as, as an input. Um, typically, uh, 10 milliseconds is common, a common choice for the delay. Depends on the switch, but, um, but that's, uh, that's an example uh, of how long you might have to wait uh, to debounce the switch, okay? All right, um, so uh, let me show you Actually, I'm going to hold off until next time on this. So we have a little bit more to talk about, about microcontrollers, um, and then I want to go on to, to motors. So, but I don't, want to, I don't want to introduce any kind of long topic at this point. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to break, uh, break class now, and then we're going to um, continue on to office hours. So, so what I would... Once I get my video up here. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, end end class, go on mute for a couple minutes, and then return for office hours. And so uh, don't forget to take a look at the homework assignments. So homework seven is up there. That's due. Lab four is finally posted. Thank you for letting me know. Don't be afraid to let me know if... Uh, there's something that is wrong. It should be posted, and it or, or and it's not there. Um, 
sometimes it's hard to get feedback from from Canvas. And uh, so if you want to join office hours, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Um, and everybody, thanks for joining the live class. And uh, be safe, be healthy. And I'll either see you at office hours or the next class. Okay, I'll be back in a couple minutes.